Atlanta, Georgia, in the early part of the century, was the fastest growing city in the South. Young people were leaving small towns and farms for factory wages. Children worked in those sweatshops. I think it was a dollar and 10 cents for a week's worth of work. One company that was doing well was National Pencil, owned by a respected Jewish family that had lived in Atlanta since before the Civil War. Most jobs were performed by young girls. One of them, Mary Fagan, was from Marietta, Georgia. On a Saturday afternoon, she came to an empty factory to pick up a week's wages. She never left the building alive. Her mutilated body was found in the basement. This was a major murder. And the murder was a brutal murder. Her dress had been torn. Her face was blackened. And there was demands to find the killer. One of only two men in the building that day was Leo Frank, nephew of the owner, who had come from New York to run the factory. He didn't look like one of us. The city of Atlanta spoke of nothing else and called for vengeance. The minister who had officiated at Mary Fagan's funeral, thank God we finally have a defendant worthy to pay for this horrendous crime not just some black factory sweeper, but a rich Jew from Brooklyn. Men like Tom Watson were more than spectators. In the Frank case, Watson saw an opportunity to bolster his magazine's flagging circulation and a failing political career. He wrote stories that said, if a black man had raped a white girl, we'd know what to do with him. Why should a Jew get any different justice or treatment? The trial began on a sweltering day in July. The windows were open. And the mobs outside were yelling in. Get the Jew, kill the Jew. If things were said that were favorable to Leo Frank, the crowd outside would boo. If things were said that were unfavorable to Frank, crowds would cheer. The jury was paraded from a hotel to the courthouse each day. They were afraid they would be lynched if they didn't convict Leo Frank. On August 25th, after just four hours of deliberation, the jury returned with their verdict. Frank was sentenced to die by hanging. Governor John Slayton was convinced the trial was a sham and that the evidence pointed to the other man in the factory that day. He commuted Frank's sentence to life imprisonment. Governor Slayton was finished. Mobs moved on the executive mansion, urged on by Tom Watson to lynch the governor. 
Only the presence of the National Guard kept Slayton and his wife from injury and death. One hundred miles southeast of Atlanta, Leo Frank was being held at the Milledgeville prison. One night, 25 men wearing masks entered the prison and pulled Frank from his bed. They cut the phone lines and walked in. Never fired a shot. The next morning in Marietta, Georgia, a large crowd gathered under an oak tree. Leo Frank had been lynched. Nobody would cut it down. People walked up to the body and tore off pieces of Frank's clothes as souvenirs. And I remember they used to say, little Mary Fagan went to work one day. Little did she know the Jew would take her life away. Tom Watson's success in the Frank case vaulted him into the U.S. Senate. He would not be the first or the last to use race and religion for political gain. Theodore Gilmore Bilbo became master of the technique. Very intelligent, and he had uh, a sense of exactly what the people of Mississippi would buy, would accept. But it's absolutely He spoke truth. their language. This did happen. And he would urge all the blacks to return to their native land. And that had great enthusiastic uh, support here and there among the whites in Mississippi. I said further that it was the duty of every white Democrat in Mississippi to resort to every means within the law to keep the niggers from voting in our primary because they were not qualified to vote. The best time to keep a nigger away from a white Democratic primary in Mississippi was to see him the night before and tell him that he had no right. Well, you can call it what you may. It's good diplomacy and good strategy to keep him from voting if we propose to hold and retain white control within our state, which we propose to do. I never knew him to be wrong. Hate and suspicion of others was not confined to the middle class, to the poor or politicians. Henry Ford was none of these.